think I'd care or stop and stare. I couldn't be annoyed if the hens refused to lay, or if bulls gave milk some way. Do you think I'd care that fair and fair? I couldn't be annoyed if everyone stood on their heads and on their hands you were sure. I'd still leave crackers in my bag. What have I got to lose if we eat soup with the pork? Or if babies brought the start? Do you think I'd care? I'd still declare I could be alone. You gotta come backstage, will you? I seem to remember you came backstage once before. Marlene Dietrich lives on in our minds not simply as an actress or singer, but even more eventful than her movie plots. Though married, she had numerous affairs with her leading men and many other famous figures of both sexes. She led a complicated life. She was a magnificent actress in real life, much better than she ever was on the screen, or was permitted to be on the screen. Well, I think that's probably... Uh, what was a great tragedy in her life, although she would never have recognized it as a tragedy. I say it is. I think Dietrich's life is a tragedy from beginning to end. It's you, Lily, my... Dietrich was born in 1901 in a small town near Berlin. Her father was a police lieutenant, and he bequeathed Marlena a military sense of duty. But he died when she was young, leaving her mother and a local school to bring her up. Quietly, she began to rebel. When she was only 16, it was common gossip at school that she had bedroom eyes. She got one professor sacked, and her first significant affair was with her violin teacher. She had musical talent, but only used it as an entree to the world she couldn't wait to join, the cabaret circuit of decadent Berlin. She threw herself into club life, first as spectator, then as a chorus girl. These were heady days in the Germany of the early 20s, and the entertainment was raucous and uncensored. We all should have been in Berlin then to go to Cabaret. Places like this, there were other places. Cabaret had been around Berlin since the turn of the century, and there were still a lot of those places with sawdust on the floor. In the early, early 20s of Berlin, of Marlena on stage, and the reviewer says, as for Marlena Dietrich, legs, legs, legs. Marlena was very ambitious, and in her ambition, she occasionally forgot to wear undergarments when she went on stage. This gave certain segments of the theatrical audience in Berlin reasons to visit her shows again and again and again. Her choice of clothes were a mark of Berlin's atmosphere of sexual freedom. One moment she was enticingly feminine, the next she was dressing like a man. She wore trousers, which in uh, Berlin in the 20s, in Sodom and Gomorrah, Berlin, was absolutely uh, acceptable. Bisexuality was an acceptable trait in Berlin. It uh, was not even discussed or considered strange. Um, there were gay bars, there were uh, bisexual bars, there were anything you wanted was out in the open. So she came from that background. Despite all this, she took the conventional route and married in 1923. She had a baby, her only child, Maria, a year later. Though they only lived together five years, Dietrich and her husband Rudy stayed married for the rest of their lives. He worked in the German film industry. The famous director was in town to cast his first talkie about a cabaret club called The Blue Angel. Von Sternberg wanted to make the Blue Angel in both German and English, so he was very careful about the actors that he was casting, and he'd had trouble casting the cabaret singer. Then one night, he went to the Berliner Theater, and when the curtain went up, he discovered that the leading lady was played by Marlene Dietrich, and she played, of all things, an American. And he discovered further she could act, 
she could sing, she was beautiful, and lo and behold, she could speak English. Three, three, and three. Three cheers for the gentleman who has drawn the first prize. That's all I had to say in one sentence, yes. And um, he saw me there and he asked the company to call me in the morning and he made me come there. And I couldn't understand it. I thought, I know the book, but there is no small part in it at all for... wanting to take her to America, he thought he could make of her as big a star as Greta Garbo was for MGM. I left Berlin the night of the opening night. I was on the ship going to America and I got cables and they said that I had a big success which I never thought I would have. She got off the boat bolstered by her success in Germany, but completely unknown in America. She decided to play up her image as the ingenue plucked from nowhere by Sternberg, and reinvented her recent past. She never, never admitted that she'd ever made silent films, because in her opinion, and I quote Dietrich, only Garbo and Gish did silent films. I never. And that became then the truth, as far as the world were concerned. Paramount's future star moved into a home provided for her by the studio. After a year, she brought Maria over to join her, and the family unit became Marlena, Maria, and Joseph von Sternberg. He was contracted to direct all her movies, and the association prospered, personally and professionally. She flowered in his hand. She became the, the fulcrum of his taste. They, they absolutely became indistinguishable in some way. Um, Sternberg's use of light and shadow, someone said he was the Leonardo of cinema, and she was his, his Mona Lisa. His obsession was woman, the, the politics of desire, the, the mystery of sexuality, and if anyone could could radiate, could encompass all of these enigmas, it was she. I still think that's the most startling star introduction in the history of motion pictures. Marlena was the first great star to be created in the sound era. And how did he do it? She sings a French song from the turn of the century, dressed in men's clothes, turns, gives a very obvious lesbian kiss to another woman. And this was the introduction, because von Sternberg made sure that except for Paris and Berlin, Morocco was seen throughout the world before the Blue Angel. This is the Marlena Dietrich he wanted us to see and remember. She's an extraordinary woman, and uh, she was a great beauty and uh, very easy to uh, respond. She responded beautifully in the and uh, gave me an, an image very often uh, which was not only exactly as I wanted but very often better than I wanted and uh, she was 
She was quite a gal. The Sternberg-Dietrich collaborations continued. She earned the title of Hollywood's undisputed Empress of Desire when they made their fourth film together in 1932. Shanghai Express was to be the most successful of them all. Sternberg made her a vision of unapproachable, world-weary sophistication, less through her acting than through image and lighting. It was a lesson Dietrich would always remember. She learned from her great original director, Joseph von Sternberg, she had learned where her key lights should be and how she should be lit to get what she called her butterfly, which is the sort of shadow shaped like a butterfly under her nose. And she was always really conscious of her lighting. Every move she made, every expression she pulled, was keyed to that lighting. Dietrich soon seemed to have absorbed all that her mentor could teach her. As she outgrew Sternberg, their partnership began to fail, both at the box office and in their personal lives. Many people saw their seventh and last film together as autobiography rather than fiction. I'm romantic, so romantic, that I often wish I had a more discreet heart. But believe me, please believe me, when I tell you that I haven't got a sweet heart. Miss Fengali had become completely disillusioned with his protégé. Did you hear me say that I had none? No, I only said I haven't none. At Paramount, it was an open secret that Marlena was having affairs with Maurice Chevalier, with Gary Cooper, with the whatever star of the moment uh, she was attracted to uh, and who was attracted by her. And I think this tortured von Sternberg to a degree, but it was as if Marlena had said to him, look, you knew I was married when you met me. You didn't expect me to be faithful, did you? Let me go. Don't you touch me, or I call for help. Are you mad, can't you? I came here as a friend. Suddenly you throw yourself into my arms, and now you accuse me. I kissed you because I loved you. For a minute. Uh, he just suffered uh, and it tore him apart and uh, he would pass the dressing room door and, and when the door was locked and that was always a cue for everybody that nobody entered and um, uh, if you do that enough times and you see it enough times and then she comes back to you always this wonderful enigma um, and that makes you love her all over again no matter how much you know, your mind is, is, is churned like in a ringer for laundry, you know, back and forth, this emotional seesaw. And he finally couldn't take it anymore. You've gone too far. You're not going to play with me anymore. Harvey the Superb! He threatened me! What right have you to tell me what to do? Are you my father? No! Are you my husband? No! Are you my lover? Dietrich and Sternberg were finished as lovers and collaborators. To make matters worse, the film then flopped at the box office. But she was now Hollywood's highest paid female star, and she could afford to travel and spend more time with her increasingly extended family. Marlene's domestic situation was basically with a series of lovers, all of whom were accepted by Rudy, her husband, who had his own domestic relations. A menage a trois, we understand. A menage a quatre and menage a cinq it was very normal in the house. Marlena, for instance, had a very well-known affair with Douglas Fairbanks, where Douglas Fairbanks moved into a schloss in Austria with Rudy and his girlfriend. Uh, these were very modern people. They were modern even by today's standards. I think you have to look at somebody like Madonna today, uh, who may not be quite as daring as Marlena was in her day. December the 10th, 1936. One of the most momentous days in the history of England. On this day, the decision of King Edward VIII was awaited with anxiety throughout the empire. Marlena was in London making uh, Night Without Armor, and Douglas Fairbanks was making pictures here as well. She was appalled at the idea that Edward VIII should 
uh, consider giving up his throne for uh, Wallace Simpson, the American divorcee. And she announced to Douglas Fairbanks that she was going to get into her car and that Briggs, the chauffeur, was going to drive her out to the country where she personally was going to sacrifice herself for the British throne. She was, I guess, going to seduce Edward VIII into staying King of England. They stopped her at the gate. After her attempt to save the monarchy failed, her next vacations were in the south of France. It's a hazy afternoon And I know a place that's quiet Except for daisies running riot And there's no one passing by it to see Come spend this lazy afternoon with me. She didn't come alone. At various times, at least six past or present lovers joined her. But pride of place was given to her new passion, Eric Maria Remarque, author of All Quiet on the Western Front. She would put down the blinds in the suite in the Cap Antibes with a hot sun outside and the white Mediterranean light. And she would say to Remarque, she would say, my sweetheart, you write, and when you're finished, you come out of your room and I will have your meal ready for you on the beach. And here she was, the, the epitome of what every author has ever wanted in a woman, uh, completely his slave to his work and his adulation and adoration of, of his ability and his talent. Right? And she would leave him close the door behind him and go downstairs and have an affair with Kennedy, you know. Uh, to her, she had done what Remarque expected of her, what she wanted to do for him at that moment. She was his. And once that door was shut, she had done it, then it was on to the next. Next at Antibes was one of her female lovers, millionaires Joe Carstairs. But while she and Marlene went off together, they left 14-year-old Maria with a female employee of Carstairs who assaulted her. I judge Dietrich not because of my being raped. That's that I have to live with and have come to terms with and is behind me. But that it should be permitted by a parent to put a child in danger. That you cannot permit anyone to do that, whether they are a movie queen, a world icon, or God Almighty. You do not put your own child at risk, particularly if you are not innocent of that risk. But her version was that it never happened. Nobody would dare. This was uh, also another facet of the Dietrich character that anything that she didn't like didn't exist. People of extreme fame can get away with living the way they wish to live because the world and our society unfortunately is warped enough to permit them to do so and in Dietrich's case this was very convenient because she did not accept things that were uncomfortable to her There's something naive on the part of the public and the reader if they really expect these stars to have been saints are nor normal in any way in their private lives. They weren't. They weren't good mothers. They weren't good companions. They weren't anything except stars. This is where all their mental and erotic energy went. Her holidays on the Riviera had been made possible by a two-year absence of movie work. Seven of her last eight films had failed, and the press had taken to calling her box office poison. Then, in summer 1939, she took a call offering her a kind of Blue Angel role opposite James Stewart in, of all things, a Western. At first she laughed. Then she took the next boat home. Bartender! See what the boys in the back room will have And tell them I'm having the same Go see what the boys in the back room will have and give them the poison they name. Joseph von Sternberg had made Marlena the world's reigning sex goddess. He'd also made her the world's most highly paid woman. But he made her untouchable. 
And by 1939, she was the world's most unemployable woman, until Universal said, come over to us and make a horse opera. She did. It was the greatest comeback in screen history, and it turned her into a very rare thing, a glamour girl with a sense of humor. My glory and my fame, just see what the boys in the back room will have, and tell them I died of the same. She sort of got to be the mainstay of the whole thing. It just amazed everybody. True to form, Dietrich was falling in love again with her leading man, and he with her. She has this fight with this girl. And Marlena, just as they were starting to do the fight, Marlena said, what are those two girls with our, with our dresses on? And they said, well, they're going to do it. You can't. You, we, we want a real fight. And they said, Yuna and I are going to do the fight. Well, if you remember, the fight it was the darndest fight scene you've ever seen. She started throwing stuff at me. Uh, she said, now, I'm not going to tell you when I'm going to throw it or where. You just make sure that you duck, because I'm going to throw it right in at your face. I didn't realize she was such a good shot. Who's buying me a drink? moves to where the entertainment is. And when a songwriter and a movie star make for the front, the mobile station follows right along. Hello, boys. Why, it's Marlena Dietrich! Reach for the sky, you coyotes. It's me, Dead-Eye Dietrich, the sheriff. Cheapers, it's the arm of the law. The legs ain't bad either. <laughs> Gee, ma'am. When America joined the Second World War, Dietrich was one of many Hollywood stars who went out to entertain the troops. She'd become a naturalized American when she saw what Hitler was doing to her homeland, so she had extra motivation to take part. What's your phone number? Actually, uh, I think Dietrich wanted to be a soldier, uh, and uh, you couldn't very well be a soldier. So she fought her way, and she did a magnificent job. Certainly when she was finally overseas, she practically was a soldier. I mean, the way her stories went, it was her boys, she was in the army. She never said, I was with the USO. She was in the army. And uh, she really came into her own. The, the Prussian soldier was in it, his element. Yes, we were simple soldiers. You had no grade? We had no grade, no. We only had a grade in case of capture. We were captains, and I always thought it was rather silly. We should have been generals, no? Because <laughs> it was only a matter of money or how they treated you yes. in case of capture. Naturally, you were all very much afraid of capture. I was very much. There she is, lovely Miss Dietrich. Hello, she'd get a tremendous ovation just by being there. She'd come out and she'd talk to them, make a few suggestive jokes and get a good reaction on those then she'd sit down and play the uh, the musical song which is very incongruous I mean it it uh, it just it just struck the guys to have this struck the guys to have this glamour creature that they'd always seen and heard about and uh, sitting there with this big saw between her legs and then she'd sing a few songs in this husky uh, whiskey tenor of hers, and they just loved it. Just see what the boys in the corner and tell them my sight, and tell them I cry, and 
Tell them I died of the same. And when I die. She was one of the most popular of all the troupe entertainers and spent 18 months constantly touring. It wasn't just her talent and her glamour that endeared her to them. The fact was she was prepared to lay down her body for the cause. A dedication extended to fulfilling the servicemen's fantasies. It was part of the romanticism uh, that, uh, you know, what, if, you, if you're going to face death, don't you want to live one time really magnificently before you face death, right? And she felt that uh, being with, uh, if a man, if a young boy, a soldier from Arkansas or uh, in the South somewhere could sleep with a movie star who was beautiful and giving and loving, was that not a proper way to prepare for the mourn of his demise? She didn't restrict herself to the enlisted men. She had a more lasting affair with the paratrooper James Gavin, the youngest general in the army. I suspect that she was fascinated by him. After all, was a, a gigantic hero, and he did have he did look like a, sort of a cross between Henry Fonda and, and uh, Gary Cooper. I mean, come on. Did she choose an ugly girl, General? <laughs> you know. When the war ended, Dietrich went to Paris, where she met up with several old friends, including the actor Jean Gabin. With him, she began the most serious love affair of her life. Marlena fell in love with Jean Gabin, and I think she would have left Rudy, and she would have married Jean Gabin. Uh, she always loved things French. She loved him, uh, as far as Dietrich could love. And um, he was volatile enough uh, to make it interesting, I think. Uh, he would um, throw her out, which had never happened to her before. Uh, and she would come begging back, which was a role that she rather liked playing, although she complained about it, but she enjoyed every minute of it because he would always take her back. So she was victorious in that. But also in Paris was General James Gavin. And Marlena's affair with General Gavin apparently lopped over into Paris. And it was through that affair, I think, that Jean Gabin understood that Marlena was not a one-man woman. And this was not a relationship that he was willing to continue on that basis. And he threw her out. Slightly used, second hand. They were lovely illusions, reaching high, built on sand. She left they Paris and returned to Hollywood where she made a film called Foreign Affair, which was about post war Berlin. On the piano was Friedrich Hollander, a composer who'd also written the songs for The Blue Angel and Destry Rides Again. You are in love. And the director was someone who'd known her since her days as a cabaret singer in Berlin, Billy Wilde. Die kannte ich aus Berlin als ich ein Journalist äh, und äh, die war auch zurück vom, von, dem, von der Front, nicht? Ja. Die war so mehr an der Front als ich war und natürlich mehr an der Front als der Eisenhower. Wir waren Freunde durch all die ja. ganzen Jahre, als sie hier mit dem Remark war und dann mit dem Gabin und äh, äh, the film was wonderful for her because it played with an old pal and uh, he let her have fun playing it slightly off one shoulder um, and she resented that she had to play maybe a Nazi that disturbed her very much but she trusted Billy enough that he would uh, have the comedy offset what might be indicated that she had been a Nazi, and he did. You are an American woman? We'll ask the questions here. What is the name of the man? Yes. Johnny? Johnny what? I see you do not believe in lipstick. And what a curious way to do your hair, or rather not to do it. Now, wait a minute. Do you know who you're talking to? An American woman. And I'm a little disappointed to tell you the truth. Also, Jean yeah, Arthur, whom she detested because she said that American. ugly, ugly pluck chicken, she called it, um, was, had a very difficult role that did not really suit her.
talent as well as the role that Dietrich had suited her, so she won the film. It's such a change. This dress. This dress is from Iowa? Oh, no, Berlin. Do you like it? Oh, it's stunning. When haven't you got it on backwards? Then in 1950, Hitchcock's film Stage Fright gave her the chance to upstage another young actress. This time it was Oscar winner Jane Wyman. Dear madam, this will introduce my cousin Doris, who is in every way a good girl. I hope you'll find her satisfactory during my illness sign, Nellie Good. This is very nice, if you can call morning nice. But uh, isn't there some way we could uh, let it plunge a little in front? I suppose not. Stage Fright and Foreign Affair, in which he played respectively with Jane Wyman and um, Jean Arthur, are in, so, in some ways two of the cruelest spectacles I've ever seen. And I blame Hitchcock and Billy Wilder for that to some degree because she does, up, she can't help but upstage them. I mean, th they look, and both of these are attractive women, but they suddenly become church mice in her presence. She just, first of all, is... Um, you know, she has a graduate degree where they're in kindergarten as far as uh, her narcissism and her sense of the camera. And they just shrivel in her presence. You wouldn't mind if I depend on you a great deal? Thank you, darling. As she approached 50, the Dietrich image was harder to sustain. It's so depressing. I think that her reputation uh, was such that everybody knew that she was, um, uh, a very, uh, was very careful and very pernickety and very um, concerned about her physical image, her looks, and certainly she took a long time in makeup and wardrobe, and uh, insisted on having her clothes done by Dior, which she had. I mean, she was well preserved. I'd be glad of the rest for a week or two. Palm trees, sunshine, lovely. She showed me one day, she used to, uh, um, before she always wore a wig, uh, in later years because um, she plaited in tiny, tiny little plaits all around her face and then she pulled them up and tied them at the top. And so the whole whole thing went right up and, and then she put the wig on top of that. This, uh, it was marvelous, but um, I don't know how the, the roots were <laughs> with all that pulling. Dietrich was still capable of attracting her leading men. On stage fright, she had an affair with co-star Michael Wilding, who went on to marry Elizabeth Taylor, 30 years Dietrich's junior and Hollywood's new great beauty. Two more ex-lovers then did exactly the same thing. Dietrich's opinion of her rival in love was almost unprintable. Elizabeth Taylor was a huge problem for Marlena because there had been Michael Wilding married Elizabeth Taylor. There had been Michael Todd, married Elizabeth Taylor. Then there was Eddie Fisher, married Elizabeth Taylor. Elizabeth Taylor was younger. Elizabeth Taylor married men that Marlena had dalliances with that didn't last. Time was beginning to tell. It was now easier to co-star with old boyfriends than with new ones. When ex-lover Michael Todd produced Around the World in 80 Days, the 54-year-old Dietrich played opposite three others who were claimed to be her old flames. Get out and stay out. If I ever catch you in here again, I'll cut you up in a thousand pieces. That won't be necessary, I'll show you. I'm just leaving. George Raft and David Diven were two. Frank Sinatra the third. Her confidence as a glamour girl now gained an unexpected boost when she made a series of live appearances. When she became ringmaster in a benefit for charity, a hotel owner saw her and invited her to Las Vegas to perform in cabaret. First I said no and then they kept on asking me and finally I weakened. And I did it in Las Vegas and I loved it from the very first time I did it. But at that time, you know, I didn't sing any serious songs. I was just uh, entertaining everybody and being beautiful, something like that. In 1953, she began a residency at the Sahara Hotel that had the effect of relaunching her entire career. Audiences who knew her from movies had no idea what an experienced live performer she was. Oh, it's worth 
The boys all love my music. I can't keep them away. So my little piano is working night and day. She even had a series of special gowns created for her that gave the illusion of being very revealing. She called them her nude dresses. Part of it that was so appealing to her was that it was direct to the audience. This is something that went back to her very earliest days in, in show business. Uh, the way she loved being loved by people. What could you ask more than to be loved by 200 people or 2,000 people? And that kept her going. I think it fueled her the way applause fuels all true performers. It's not cause I shouldn't. Not cause I wouldn't. And you know. Not cause I couldn't. Simply because I'm the laziest girl in town. My poor heart is aching. To bring home the bacon And if I'm alone and forsaken Simply because I'm the laziest girl in town I'm just lazy Dietrich became the highest paid cabaret artist in the world She repeated her success in London and finally on Broadway. But she became the most eccentric of travelers. Now, I don't know whether anybody out there in the audience has ever heard this about Dietrich, but everything had to be clean where she was. She was a freak about it. She, was, she traveled with her own Ajax, so, you know, just for... And uh, her own SOS pads and her own soap and her own everything. She, just, she would arrive at a theater and completely clean it. Not have them clean it. She would clean it. Um... She was famous for this. Um, she came to my dressing room just to wait for all of us. We were all going to go to supper together. So I said, you know, make yourself coffee, make a drink, whatever. And she completely rearranged my makeup table. She cleaned the entire dressing room. It was not to be believed. I couldn't get over it. The New York Times dubbed her Queen of Ajax. Broadway changed it to Queen of the World. Every ticket there sold out weeks in advance, and she won a special Tony Award. She had toured her show through Europe, Japan, Australia, South America, and Russia. She still made occasional movies, but this was now her main career. She even risked returning to Berlin. It was her first visit since the end of the war, when they'd called her an enemy and a traitor. Many Germans didn't want her back, but she won over a hostile audience and took 18 curtain calls. She toured from the late 1950s to the early 1970s. The lifestyle was beginning to take its toll. Well, she always sort of had a little nip behind stage. She, she used to like to have a, a glass of champagne to clear her throat between songs while the audience was going crazy applauding for her, while Anna would have a little bit of Dom Perignon and, and go back on stage and charm everybody. Yeah, it got pretty scary at times. Uh, I could, I would always uh, kiss her before I went on stage to conduct the overture. And as soon as I got within, you know, a few inches of her, I could tell. And uh, I'd say to the orchestra, watch me very carefully tonight, you know, because she would skip bars or she'd forget what the next song was or she'd forget a lyric or whatever. Until finally it got so bad that she would wave it, you know, she would totter. And um, then, you know, she would totter. And um, then she fell in one of those moments of stupor. And she fell quite often, but she didn't break anything. And then that one time she fell. And she was lying at the edge of the stage saying, bring down the curtain, bring down the curtain. Her leg had broken. And it was a compound fracture that went through the flesh. It never healed. Nobody knew this because we used to bandage her leg with water compresses underneath this shimmering dress. And for me, 
uh, it was an, uh, a macabre and yet amazingly moving idea to see this shimmering body standing on that stage in that pink light all by herself, this soldier alone on the battlefield, because a stage is like a battlefield. And underneath I knew that there were these oozing wounds. I get no kick from champagne, the alcohol doesn't thrill me at all, so tell me why should it be true that I won't get a kick. I dried her out three times. Three times she was sober. Three times she was dried out. Three times she remained sober because of the accidents, because no surgery could be performed on an alcoholic. That's very, very dangerous. And each time I brought her back from the hospitals, straight to that bottle, straight to those pills. In 1976, her husband, Rudy, died. Though they hadn't lived together since the 20s, he'd remained a faithful friend and support. Without him, her will to continue working finally began to fade. It's, um, it's a terrible thing to watch self-destruction in someone who has been that perfection in that realm of what we call fame and beauty and looks. Dietrich eventually retired from the stage in 1976 when she was 74 years old. But she made one final appearance in 1978 in the movie Just a Gigolo. For many, it was unintentionally poignant. When the end comes, I know He'll say just a chigolo And life goes on without me She withdrew into her Paris apartment and never left it again. For the final 13 years of her life, she lived in seclusion. The last 12 she spent in bed, connected to the world only by her telephone. Any degenerative thing, any uh, decay of the Dietrich picture, the legend, uh, was abhorrent to her, not because she was afraid of age, because she was afraid of tarnishing the legend. It's a big difference, and it's very difficult for people to understand. Because most women, when they become old, don't want to look in the mirror and hide themselves because they don't want to face. That was not Dietrich. Dietrich did not become a recluse because she didn't want to face her age. She became a recluse because the legend no longer was able to be re-embellished. Marlene Dietrich died on May 6, 1992. Her funeral was held at her favorite church, La Madeleine, in Paris. The tricolore on the coffin bore medals she'd won for her service in the war against Germany. Ironically, her coffin's final journey was to Berlin. She was buried close to her mother. Marlene was dead. But the image of Lola Lola, the Blue Angel, that was not. We often think of her not as being an actress, but as being Marlena Dietrich. She became a legend. She knew she was a legend. She kept it alive for 90 years. I think it's great to be an icon, to be a movie star, but you cannot pray to these people. I have great respect for the professional Dietrich, 
great respect. As a human being, I reserve my respect, but not to, as a, to a professional. Love's always been my game Play it how I may I was made that way I can't help it Men cluster to me like moths around a flame And if their wings burn I know I'm not to blame Falling in love again Never wanted to What am I to do? I just can't help you. <laughs>